Let's together just briefly pray and ask our God for the help that we each need. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news concerning Jesus Christ. We call out tonight and ask again that you would help us to hear that message, to delight in what we hear, to embrace it for the first time, or Lord, to be uh, excited to hear it perhaps for the thousandth time, that we may delight in you and all that you have done for us. We who are in much need, we thank you that you meet our need. And Lord, we ask for that which is our need right now, that you would come and give us minds to concentrate and ears to hear your voice. And Lord, above all, hearts and wills to respond in love and submission. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure we are all conscious that we are living in a world of many problems. Horrible events in these last few days in France is perhaps enough for us to say we are living in a world with lots of problems. But we haven't got to look just overseas. We certainly know on a local level, we, we hear the headlines about domestic violence within our own community, uh, domestic violence within our own country, within our own state, and how so often now it seems to be ending with all murders. We hear that too much in these days. But the problem in this world, it's not just merely a, of a global nature, is it? It's not just merely something that's on a local level. The fact is problems fill our lives really. No one is without difficulties. Not one of us, no matter who we are, are without difficulties. We find conflicts all around us. We certainly find, in a sense, conflict within us. It is the experience of every human. But we have all discovered this. Life involves difficulties. No matter how young you might be, no matter how old you might be, we all know this. There is a deep-seated sense in which we know that we really are not meant to be. But this is what we are like. All are searching for some solution to these problems of life. We all search. Everyone's doing it. We cannot escape it. It's in our face every day, suffering, struggles, we certainly can't hear the media, we can't hear the news without having that place before us again and again, as I suggested, just a couple of things just before. Life is full of perplexing things. A lot of questions don't have simple answers. Some of those complexing things are near at hand. Some of them are not just what's happened in Paris in the last few days. Some of it's about what's happening even closer at home. But beyond those, the point I'm simply wanting to bring to your mind as we begin to think this afternoon is that even between us and within us, there is confusion. There is misunderstanding. There are points of tension. There are sometimes rivalries. There are jealousies. These are part of our lives. You see, the whole world, if you like, seems to be a large-scale outplay of what we experience within. This tension, this, this struggle, this emptiness dwells with inside of us. Each of us carries it with us. Everybody is searching for the answers. But the thing is, most don't search in the right place. Friends, God has spoken. God provides the answers. God has provided the answer. That's really what our concern is this afternoon. It's to hear what God says. The Christian church does not exist to create a platform for us to hear the ideas of men or to ask to hear the philosophies of men. 
We are here to declare God's message. We are here to hear what he has to say. The Bible is God's self-disclosure to man, his revelation. It's his explanation of why things are as they are. And as was read to us before, we're coming to chapter 3 tonight and I believe it's one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. It's like a mirror, Genesis chapter 3. We can look into this chapter and you know what? We can see ourselves. It explains who we are. It explains what we are. It's the questions that we all have. Why am I the way I am? Genesis 3 reveals what God has done for all humanity in its real and pressing need. Genesis 3 is a chapter of hope in the midst of otherwise perhaps fear. It's like a beam of light into a community of darkness. And so I ask that, as even we prayed before, that God would open our hearts, even now as we open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. You know, Genesis, of course, commences with a one, not a three. Genesis chapter 1 records that when God created man and woman, that they were made perfect. It tells us that God saw everything that he made, including the man and the woman, and, and, and God says, and it was very good. Mankind was complete in every way. Physically, there was no disease, there was, no, there was nothing lacking in humanity. Mentally, emotionally, psychologically, man and woman were completely and, and, and wonderfully balanced creatures. Spiritually, they were right before God. They were right with one another. In Genesis chapter 2, the record of the command that God gave to Adam. If you have your Bible there, you might like to look just back to what that command was. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, where we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There's the command. You're free to eat from every tree but just one. We don't know how many trees there were. There was probably thousands and thousands of trees. But just don't take the fruit from that one tree. If you do eat the forbidden fruit, you will die. When we come into chapter 3, as we read earlier, the woman is tempted, initially is the one, to disobey that command. She's deceived. She listens to a lie. She believes the Satan. She reaches and she eats that forbidden fruit. She gave it to her husband. He too ate the forbidden fruit and because of that act of disobedience the entire world was changed. Mankind falls from the pristine glory that he had to become a shadow of himself. What does God do? Well, yet God is infinitely kind. And as we'll see, God comes seeking Adam and God calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? It's a direct, it's a personal question that he's asking. You see, God speaks to individuals. He speaks to us even as individuals from Genesis chapter 3. He speaks to where you are tonight, why you are there and how you can get from there. So look with me now as we come into Genesis chapter 3 and there are three things for us to look at. I want to draw your attention to three things in the the chapter. Again, it's a big chapter like we said this morning. There's far too much to be dealt with in just uh, one sitting but I just want to bring out three things. The first one is the truth denied. Look at verse 6 and 7 as we hone in to this this section in the middle here in Genesis 3. And So here's the act itself in verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, I want to have that fruit. A tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Now verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and, and made themselves coverings. It says there in verse 7, Then their eyes were opened. Does that mean their eyes were closed before? 
Well, no, it doesn't mean that. This is not saying for this they were blind and now they've got physical sight. That, that's not what this is meaning. Let me just state the obvious. What this is saying is after their disobedience and rebellion, Adam and Eve became very conscious of something. There was something that was true that they could not deny. There was something now that they had lost. They began to see, they began to recognise that they had changed. They had actually lost something that they had before that was very precious. You see, they knew in some sense, in a way, that was different from before, that they were naked. They were always naked. But now there's a sense in which they've realised that they've lost something. And so verse 7 simply says, they knew that they were naked. This truth hit them. They're not complete. Something had gone from there before. Their former glory had now departed. And friends, that has been the experience of humanity ever since. The truth, it's, it's undeniable. That there is nothing more fundamental than this for every one of us. We stop and actually think we each have that internal sense of loss. Is it not true that we each know that we are missing something in our lives, in our person. We really are convinced that, that whatever our lives have been up until today, there's something better. There's something deeper. There's something higher. There's something more satisfying. There is something more lasting than I have known so far in my life. Now, we might try and distract ourselves by filling our minds with something. Maybe we run for the sport. Maybe it's the music. Maybe it's movies. And yet, we each sense this. We all do. Not one of us avoids this. It touches every person right here now. We all know that there is something more somewhere, somehow. And here's where the Bible stands out, friends. Here's where Genesis 3 is the mirror into our innermost beings. It shows us who we are. It shows us that we each have this deep-seated restlessness. Now why? Why this constant search for something beyond our current experience? Well, the Bible's answer to that is if we were made for something higher than we currently are. It's like God has programmed into our computer minds. He's etched it into the very consciousness of our humanity. We've lost something. As humans, we all that we once were. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam we all died. And there's a sense in which something has died within us. As I said before, Genesis chapter 1 tells us that man was made upright. Genesis chapter 1, just jump back there with me to verse 27 where the, where the Bible describes something of how wonderful man was at the start. So God created, Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God made man, God made woman, God made humanity and in this perfect image of himself. But mankind is no longer like that. Man is, is no longer so... Man has fallen, if you will, off the perch. Sin has ruined our race. It's impacted our humanity. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, in Genesis 3, 7, it says what? Then, they ate the fruit, verse 6, verse 7 commences... Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Here's Adam, here's Eve. We did a census back then. That's the entire population. That is humanity. That is, that is mankind together in one couple. And so it's right for us to say that 100% of humanity, the entire population, had this experience. Their eyes were opened immediately after that sin when they had fallen. You see... 
we all know this intuitively, intuitively deep within us. We feel the struggle, that inner tension and vacancy. We were meant to be creatures of peace and happiness, but that's not what we are. Sometimes we may feel we get it, but then we know we lose it. A life of joy and deep fulfilment truly does elude us. We may have it for a moment, for a life. Something has been lost, it's been taken from us. And so all humanity, you and I in that number, are restless. We are never really at complete ease and peace. It is true that we find it hard to lose. Don't we, husband, wife, (laughs) children, brothers and sisters, reality check, workplace. Think of it. In a moment of honesty we know We do not find it easy. We find it hard to live with others. But beyond that, friends, I want us to think at another level. In those rare moments of quiet, you know those moments, they're pretty rare in our culture, when the music's turned off, when all the racket and all the noise has faded away and we have one of those occasions of honesty with ourselves, We know we find it difficult not just to live with others, but we find it difficult to live with ourselves. Why? Because something is missing. And so when the scientist comes out and the scientist tells us that we as humans are just another animal and that we were just made to be on this planet a while and then expire and die, and that that life really has no purpose. When we hear that, we actually know in our heart of hearts that cannot be true because there is a truth that is undenied in the human heart. We have a deep sense of destiny, don't we? We have a deep sense of purpose within us that we for something more than this. And no matter where we might go, no matter what we might do, we cannot shake this. We cannot escape this. We may go to live somewhere else. We cannot get away from this. This is who we are. And yet now I want us to notice the next thing that Adam and Eve and for that matter that you and I try to do in verse 7, and that's the folly tried. But verse 7 goes on to say, say, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now this. And they sewed fig leaves and made themselves coverings. Now, when we read that and try and picture that, I think we should try and picture what this was. That's, that's only legitimate. That's how it's been written. It's a narrative. It's a story. And God would have us use our imagination. But I I don't think we should necessarily think that Adam went out, he found a splinter of wood, he pulled out his his pen knife and and, and he whittled it into a little needle and he drilled a hole at one end and then he went over and found a a horse and he he, he pulled the hair out and he he gave the hair and and the whittled needle to Eve and said, okay, Eve, crash going. Here's the implement, there's some leaves, Do your stuff, lady. I don't think we should think that when it says, well, the language is in the New King James, they sewed fig leaves together. They didn't get it, she didn't get out of (laughs) overlocker. She didn't get out of a genome, what's the, genome? She didn't get out of a sewing machine. Singer, that's the old one. That word sewed can simply refer to the act of tying or twisting together. And so the point is they began what we might call the fig leaf folly. You see, they're deeply conscious that something was wrong. They're moved by a sense of shame and they then set out to to, to work. They're earnest here and they're trying their best to cover this themselves. They, they obviously knew, as they were, they obviously knew that something had to be done about their situation. They weren't in denial. They knew they had to do something. That was the thing that came into their heads first. And so what do they do? They, they reach, Adam and Eve, they reach for some 
fig leaves. Now, why fig leaves? Well, maybe it was just the tree that was near them. I don't have the answer to that. But that's what they did. They, they effectively made this attempt by these fig leaves to cover themselves. And I think and we, as we observe this activity, Adam's like the founder of the self-help movement. Isn't this what's happening here? That, that, that movement, of course, it may have been started by him. It's alive and well today. Trying to find the answer ourselves. Trying to help ourselves out of our situation. Now, that's not always wrong. Is it? Of course it's not. Not in situation, but in the absolute sense here, it, this is where we find a, the folly. It's the folly that they try. They're, they're trying to cover nakedness with fig leaves. I mean, is that going to work? A moment of contemplation by us and we'd say, hang on, why didn't they think? But they... This is where the default line came. This is, a, if you like, the default thing of the human mind now because of sin. This is going to work. Of course, this is not just about Adam and Eve, is it? This is about our culture. This is, this is actually what we do. This is the fig leaf folly that we buy in our lives. Fig trees have lots of leaves and everyone is clamouring to get their type of leaf to cover themselves. Let me suggest what some of those leaves are that might be part of that attempt. Some reach for the nearby fig leaf of and their thinking is that th this is what I need to cover the loss and to cover the shame. And so there's this deep search for insight and understanding. That they're convinced that knowledge will fill the void. It will cover their need. If you know your Bible, you know that King Solomon tried that. He gave it a good crack. Say, And what's the conclusion? His own conclusion in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 16. Well, he tells us. Look, he, he says, I have attained greatness. I have gained more wisdom than all before me. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. I set my heart to know wisdom and to know folly. And that, what's his conclusion? He says, I perceived that this also is grasping for the wind. We talked about the wind this morning. Have you ever tried to lay hold of the wind? To grab it? Well, that's his point. The pursuit of knowledge, that's going to cover and to make up for this loss in the humanity, it's, it's as pointless as thinking that you can grab hold of the wind. It's like trying to cover your nakedness with a few leaves of a fig tree. It's just not adequate. It's a foolish attempt. And so we say, oh, well, we would have put the fig leaf of knowledge to the side. And others say, well, hang on a bit. Try this fig leaf, the fig leaf of music or, or, or some other form of entertainment. And the thought is that somehow that, that by having this entertainment, by having this music, it's going to cover a deep-seated lacking. Of course, the problem with that, that, that's an experience, really. And that experience is not a lasting experience. And that experience needs to be replaced with another experience. And then another experience. And then another experience. And isn't that true? I mean, let me ask a question. You get a type song, don't you? If you listen to the music, you probably don't just listen to one song. You get tired of that old song. You may have a favourite movie, but you don't keep watching the same movie. You get tired of that same thing. You want to else, another experience. It's a lot, it, that thing doesn't cut it. It's just like Adam's fig leaf. It's a temporary fix. You think about a fig leaf, really, to cover your nakedness. I mean, how long is it going to last? It's going to get old, it's going to get crackly, it's going to get... Not a great idea. And so, we reach for a new leaf. And some would say, well, what about education? That's a fig leaf, isn't it? Surely, that'll bridge the gap, that, that'll fill the void... I mean, our socially diverse, multicultural community, what does it need? It just needs better education. That's a policy that we keep hearing. Try this leaf on for size. Better education. 
Here's the answer for domestic violence that's out of control in our society. Well, well, they just need better education. Here's the answer for the criminals. They just need better education. Put the leaf on. Does it cover? No, it doesn't. Surely the fig leaf of social action would work. The human race is a great believer in political action. It always has. I mean, just pass some new legislation and then things will be put right. You know, we can overcome terrorism with stronger laws. That's the thinking. Well, let's just join forces. That's how we'll have protection. Let's get together and talk and organise something. We can overcome this. Let's reach for the fig leaf by marching for peace. A unity rally. That'll do it. Political action. That's the right policy. We can do this together. If you think back to the story, that's really what Adam and Eve were saying, weren't they? Adam and Eve were working together as a united team, convinced that what they did together could overcome what they knew was wrong. Humanity is still trying this. Sowing leaves in an effort to deal with something that is wrong with our race. That's wrong not just on the outside, and this is where it's ludicrous, because we all know the wrong part is what's inside. Our world is so busy to cover up its nakedness, trying to get glory that has been lost. Who told Adam and Eve that they were naked anyway? You thought of that? Who told them? Well, no one needed to tell them. They knew it intuitively. They tried to enact a self-help program because they knew they were naked. And they thought that their own efforts would make a difference in their lives. They thought that they themselves could become better people by their own efforts. But all their ingenuity of twisting the stem this way and tying the stalk the other way failed miserably. But friends, perhaps the fig leaf that is the one that is in the reach of many of us here, the one that perhaps we here are more in danger of reaching for, and that is the fig leaf of self-righteousness. Prior to Adam beginning, they were naked. But back then, things were very different. Look with me back at the Bible to the last verse in chapter 2, verse 25. It tells us they were naked, but it shows us how they were feeling about it. And they were naked, it says, the man and his wife, and not ashamed. But when we get into chapter 3, when sin entered their hearts, now there was a sense of real shame. Their eyes were open to the fact that they had lost their innocence before a holy and a just creator. They knew they had disobeyed. They had a guilty conscience. So what do they do? They try and cover over these things. They convince themselves that through their own efforts that they could actually pack things up with God and still be accepted by Him. That their careful and their earnest work with those leaves would actually be, that would be acceptable before God. As I said before, this seems to be the default, default position still in our world. But what about us? You see, we can convince ourselves, yes, I have sinned, and we know that's the case, we've disobeyed God. But we can convince ourselves, well, yeah, okay, I've sinned, but but God will still accept me. I mean, my religion, my prayers, my church attendance, my giving, my sincerity will count. You know, there are many people today and maybe you are one of them that are completely convinced and maybe you are completely convinced that your efforts to live a good life and to be kind to others that that's actually going to cover your sins. That's, that's reaching for a flimsy fig leaf that can never truly be a covering for moral nakedness. Let me ask you, let's be honest together. 
Have you been trying to cover your spiritual nakedness with a few leaves of religion? Do you really think that your church attendance, do you really think that your baptism, that your good deeds will actually really satisfy a perfectly holy God? The God who knows not just your outward action, but the God who sees you. He sees your attitudes. He sees your thoughts. The God who tells us what he is like in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. To cover your moral nakedness with leaves of religion? My friend, that is as effective as Adam and Eve in their foolish attempt to sew some fig leaves together to cover their physical nakedness. Now we know that didn't work for them because of what verse 8 says. Look with me now as we move on quickly to... How do we know it didn't work? Well, verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, where's their leaves now? Well, maybe they still got them on, but it's made no difference. Because when they had to have direct God personally, what do they do? (laughs) They ran to hide. Why? Keep reading with me. Verse 9, The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was no and I hid myself. And so there's a sense of fear. They are afraid. There's shame that's washed over them. Leaves couldn't deal with shame. Shame's on the inside. Leaves are on the outside here due to guilt and the Bible tells us that is true for all of us as much as people may try and deny it verbally internally we know it's true there is a voice that is inside of us that accuses us and it is that voice that condemns us the Bible calls it our conscience And so when we disobey God, when we reach for and when we eat the forbidden fruit, we too soon find it's not as pleasant as we initially thought that it was going to be. It looks like an orange, gonna I take it? It's a lemon. It's sour. You see, sin might appear like sweet fruit, but it always leaves a sour taste in our mouths. Not only that, but something happens internally when we eat the forbidden fruit. A kind of spiritual indigestion, if you like, follows the eating of forbidden fruit. Somehow it lingers on. We can't get away from it. Something eats away at us inside. That internal sense of shame, of guilt and of fear that can by sin. It cannot be silenced by external efforts, by patching leaves on the outside. We cannot avoid this. Not one of us can. We we might try to run, hide from God. We might try to distract ourselves. But we can't. Because that sense of guilt, that sense of judgment is ever with us. And yet as we try to run from God, what does God do? What happens here in the passage? What happens in Genesis 3? They're running from God. But what is God doing? God is coming to them in love. God is calling in love to Adam. But Adam still tries to hide. The very one who can help him, who can restore him, who can save him, he runs from him. And that's us, friends. That's all. And you know, this is perhaps the saddest thing of all in this story. That man in his shame, man in his misery, man in his emptiness, that he knows that he's lost something, that he runs away from the God who is calling out to him, he runs away from the voice of God. Is that what you are doing? Trying to run from God? And yet here still God pursues them. 
Look at verse 11. He asked them questions. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should... What's God doing here? Well, God is, if you like, drawing them out to a place of honesty before him. He's drawing them out and he wants to show them that they can't fix this themselves. That they can't avoid him. He wants them to see that they've been found out. He wants them to know that he is actually the one who has supplied the answer for their need. That he can save them from themselves and save them from the consequence of their sin. He wants them to know that he is the saviour of sinners and that he has made the provision of covering for them that they need and that their attempts will never ever work. Which brings us to the third and final thing and that's the answer supplied and we're going to jump down in the passage now to verse 21. Genesis 3.21 Also for Adam and Eve, his wife, Adam and his wife, sorry, the Lord God made tunics of skin clothed them. The fig leaves of man's coverings were totally inadequate. They had to be put aside, they had to be thrown off as God in love supplies their need. And what does God supply for them? Ply them with some sort of temporary covering like those fig leaves, but he gives to them a permanent covering, something that will last. What does verse 21 tell us it is? It's skins. They're going to last the distance. That's the garment you want. Not a leaf. You want a skin. Something is a covering, neck to knee is the idea here, not just a few little coverings of scratchy old leaves. We see here how this answer supplied, how did it come about? Well, what is it? It's skins of an animal. God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. They had to be dead death of an innocent victim and so there is life of an innocent victim that had to be given in order to make a covering for these who are guilty you see here right at the beginning of history God introduces the concept of what the Bible calls sacrifice that is the shedding of blood in order to cover sin God's justice demands a payment Sometimes we like to think, well, God will just ignore it. God will just turn a blind eye. God does not turn a blind eye to sin. He is a just God. He is true to himself. The Bible tells us that the payment for sin is death. The Bible also says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. And so here in verse 21, the act of God was actually a picture of what Jesus, God's Son, perfectly fulfilled when he died in the place of sinners on the cross. God's son, the innocent one, dies in the place of the guilty ones. We're the guilty ones. His life was given in order to cover our sin. His blood was shed. The Lamb of God, the Bible calls him, was he shed his blood to wash away our sin. We're contaminated and needs to be washed away. We need to be made clean before the holy, clean. God. And so as we rise from this passage, friends, what is God saying to us in Genesis chapter 3? Well, the message is simple. Your salvation, my salvation and acceptance with God does not come on the basis of human effort. It will not come through your religion. It will not come through your self-righteousness. That's like putting fig leaves on. Salvation before God is by God's act of grace alone. He must provide the sacrifice. We must be clothed with His righteousness. We cannot shake it, friends. Be aware of that inner restlessness, the thirst, the searching for something you cannot find. You know that sense of loss, that shame, that internal guilt. My friend, I urge you, give up trying to deliver yourself. Throw away your fig leaves of religion. By your own efforts, you can never get rid of your sense of guilt. Your conscience will follow you wherever you go. 
as long as you are alive, your conscience will go with you, but it's worse than that. Even the grave, if you never come to Jesus Christ for, for salvation, your conscience will go with you and it will torment, torment you in hell for eternity. You'll never be able to silence it. You'll never get rid of that sense of shame. Never ever get rid of guilt. That sense of failure. Never. Unless you come to Jesus Christ and believe what He has done for you. Have you heard the voice of God to your heart tonight? He has been speaking through His Bible. He has shown you your great need. He has shown you perhaps your folly of trying to cover it over with fig leaves. He has shown you that nothing that you do can deliver you out of this, but it's only through what He has in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we would say to you, call out to Him and ask Him, even in prayer, to save you from your sins through the life and death of His Son. Turn from your sin and trust fully in what Jesus has done for sinners. The Bible promises, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah, there's no qualifier there. It doesn't say you have to reach double figures and be a ten-year-old. It doesn't say that, 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 well, if you have done that sin and that sin, well, you, you're not going to get that answer. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, be saved tonight, my friend, through Jesus Christ the Saviour of sinners. Genesis chapter 3 shows us ourselves, but it also shows us the way of salvation through Jesus. Well, amen. And may God bless every part of his word to each of us this evening. Let's together, in a brief moment of prayer, bow our heads. Almighty God, we thank you that your Bible is a book of incredible relevance for our lives. We thank you that it speaks to our world, it speaks to our own hearts. We thank you that it honestly reveals what we're like, and yet it does it not to be cruel. You are the one who is doing this, Father, that you might show us that we need you and that you show us what the answer is. And for this together, we praise you. And even we who are your people tonight, we thank you for this glorious message that you have brought us to believe. We pray that you would help us as we would seek to share it with others, that we would help them to see it's not their religion, but they need the righteousness of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.